Did the CIA, under President Trump, plan to kidnap and assassinate WikiLeaks founder Julian Assange during the shootout? Assange always maintained he was a journalist. That the United States is trying to criminalize journalism. Uh, the indictment of Julian Assange has raised fears of the freedom of press in the United States. Hello, I'm Richard Gisbert, and you're at The Listening Post, where we don't cover the news, we cover the way the news is covered. Here are some of the media angles we're examining this week. It's the kind of news story that WikiLeaks has been known to break, only it was about WikiLeaks, Julian Assange, and how far the CIA was willing to go to put the organization out of commission. Some senior Trump administration officials and CIA executives even discussed assassinating Assange. Facebook is under scrutiny yet again as a new PR initiative backfires. Translation is transformation, how literature changes as it moves from one language to another. And after 16 years of leading the country as its chancellor, yes, Angela is leaving. Germany is saying goodbye to Angela Merkel. It was like something straight out of a Bond film, not the one that premiered in cinemas this week, but a factual story, allegations of kidnapping and assassination plots discussed by American intelligence officials targeting WikiLeaks founder Julian Assange. On September 26th, Yahoo News dropped an explosive report based on interviews with more than 30 unnamed former U.S. intelligence sources detailing what it called the CIA's war on WikiLeaks, a Trump administration plan to silence the man and organization that unveiled some of the American government's most guarded secrets. The expose rippled through the press freedom community because of its implications for more conventional journalists. But like so much of the Assange story, it has received nothing like the media coverage it deserves. With Assange's legal fate being decided in a British extradition hearing later this month, Yahoo's report could end up before the judge in the form of evidence. Our starting point this week is Washington. The Trump era ended eight months ago, leaving the Biden administration to deal with some of the consequences, such as this investigation by Yahoo News. Some senior Trump administration officials and CIA executives even discussed assassinating Assange. The three reporters involved say they interviewed dozens of former U.S. intelligence officials, all of them anonymous, who confirmed the CIA and the Trump White House repeatedly discussed the lengths they would go to to get to the man, Julian Assange, and the organization, WikiLeaks, that have plagued the American government, its defense and military establishments, sectors that do so much of their work in secret. They claim to have interviewed more than 30 former U.S. government officials, including eight who spoke of scenarios such as a possible abduction of Julian Assange or even plots to kill him. They were concerned about possible plot for the Russians to break Julian Assange out of the Ecuadorian embassy. And some of the scenarios then did involve uh, British assistance as well. And then also discussing a rendition operation against Julian Assange, something previously unknown taking a plane and, and abducting him from the Ecuador embassy, bringing him back to the United States, potentially interrogating him in secret. And they redefined the organization as a hostile entity. Language that Mike Pompeo used in his first public remarks as CIA director. WikiLeaks walks like a hostile intelligence service and talks like a hostile intelligence service. The Yahoo team reported the CIA stepped up its pursuit of Julian Assange under Donald Trump and was ordered to do so by its director at the time, Mike Pompeo. The U.S. government's war on WikiLeaks predated Trump's time in office, but the Obama administration had drawn a line. It faced what it called the New York Times problem. The perception that going after Assange and WikiLeaks amounted to an attack on more conventional news outlets. Yahoo reports that the Vault 7 story, which WikiLeaks broke in early 2017, changed the thinking. Because of what it revealed, and because Pompeo and the intelligence operatives at the CIA's headquarters in Langley, Virginia, took the Vault 7 leak personally. The Vault 7 material uh, contained the CIA's 
most sensitive hacking tools, how the CIA uh, penetrated computer networks around the world, how it uh, penetrated iPhones, how it tracked the communications and activities of perceived adversaries. This was uh, a huge sensitive matter for the CIA. Mike Pompeo had been somewhat dismissive of uh, WikiLeaks' role in the 2016 election. But when he comes into Langley in early 2017 and the Vault 7 leak happens on his watch, now it's his agency, he's the one responsible. And Pompeo was embarrassed by this. He didn't want to go see President Donald Trump and face him and have a discussion about what went wrong with the CIA. And in fact, the CIA had laughed at the Pentagon as they saw that those files from the Pentagon exposing the Iraq and Afghanistan wars were published by WikiLeaks. And they laughed at the State Department because 250,000 plus diplomatic cables were published from Chelsea Manning by WikiLeaks. And so, this was an embarrassment and he decided that he was going to be out for blood and seek vengeance against WikiLeaks. I can say we never we never conducted planning to violate US law. No. Pompeo is unapologetic. He's tried to discredit Yahoo's sources, but has stopped well short of denying the story. Beyond the Vault 7 angle, the more than 30 sources Yahoo had, the detailed quotes from senior Trump administration officials, the story was not entirely new. Reports of CIA plots to target Julian Assange had already made the rounds, but it took Yahoo rather than legacy news outlets like the Washington Post or the New York Times to put it all together. Mainstream outlets, including the Times, which happily published the news WikiLeaks revealed and benefited from all those clicks, have been suspiciously silent on these latest revelations, which is consistent with their lack of interest and coverage of Assange's ongoing extradition case in the UK. This particular story has gotten pretty wide pickup in the UK now by uh, m most of the major newspapers here, although notably not yet the BBC. Um, in the US, it seems to be getting less coverage. That maybe fits into a bit of a pattern. With Julian Assange's case, there is a public perception of him that is very unhelpful at times. And I think that has turned many people off. There has been a growing amount of coverage since the extradition proceeding started. And I think there is now growing consensus that there needs to be solidarity on the principles of this case, whether or not uh, individuals decide that they feel Assange himself is worth defending. The extent of the CIA's efforts to silence Assange must send a chill down any national security reporter's spine. The reason that the CIA targeted Julian Assange and that the Justice Department later indicted him is that he solicited and obtained and published truthful information on matters of clear public concern dating back to 2010 to, to war crimes effectively. And many of these charges could have been brought against and could be brought against national security and investigative journalists for doing their jobs. Unlike his predecessor, President Biden talks a good game on the importance of the fourth estate. On World Press Freedom Day, he said journalists uncover the truth and are indispensable to the functioning of democracy. Okay, let's go to Al Jazeera first. Which landed his press secretary in a tough spot when asked by Al Jazeera to explain the disconnect between Biden's rhetoric on press freedom and his administration's continued pursuit of Julian Assange. I don't have anything new to say on, the, uh, on Julian Assange. You see silence, you see dodging, you see evasion from the Biden administration. See this as a freedom of press issue with respect to Assange? Again, I have nothing, I have nothing new to speak to on Julian this Assange. Is something and every day that the Biden administration continues this prosecution, they are emboldening authoritarians or tyrants, giving them a way to deflect any questions about how they treat journalists within their own country. And I'm not saying this hypothetically, you could cut to a clip right now of leaders of countries like Azerbaijan say that they are not going to take questions from the BBC and address their own press freedom. How do you assess what happened to Mr. Assange? Is it a reflection of free media in your country?
because Julian Assange is in a jail cell. We saw this with China's foreign ministry, who has said that they do not have to address concerns about how they treat journalists because the U.S. is continuing the case against Julian Assange. Earlier this year, a British judge denied Washington's extradition request, ruling Julian Assange would be a suicide risk if put in a U.S. prison. The American authorities have appealed. That hearing is set for later this month. Assange's lawyers will have poured over the Yahoo report, which may have bolstered the case against extradition. The grounds that the British judge used to block the U.S. government's request for extradition were pretty narrow. They were about uh, the risk of suicide that Assange would face were he to serve time in a U.S. prison. The British court case doesn't go to these larger issues of press freedom and potential government misconduct that we laid out in the piece. Now, there's talk among Assange's legal team of possibly trying to broaden the parameters of that British uh, extradition case to include some of these allegations. The journalists at Yahoo um, have likely strengthened the case against extraditing Julian Assange to the United States through the reporting that they've done here. The Yahoo News reporting reveals that U.S. officials seriously considered taking extrajudicial and frankly illegal action uh, to silence Julian Assange. And I expect that his lawyers will make a strong case in defense of the magistrate court's decision to deny the United States request to extradite him. That would be poetic. American journalists, through their reporting, potentially having an impact on a court case that has such significant implications for the future of journalism. A project that was given the green light by Facebook CEO Mark Zuckerberg to push positive stories about the company on its own newsfeed has backfired. Meenakshi Ravi has been on this. Meena, this looks like a PR campaign gone bad. Exactly, Richard. According to the New York Times, Project Amplify was signed off by Zuckerberg in August, and it's been trialed in three American cities. It pushes stories like this to the top of newsfeeds. Facebook's latest innovations for 2021 on achieving, quote, 100% renewable energy for its global operations. The news feed is central to the Facebook experience. It's where users see what's being shared. It was never sold as a stage for Facebook's own PR material. And this is happening when outlets like the Wall Street Journal are doing stories on Facebook that appear to be slightly more news feed worthy. Yeah. Last week, the journal published an investigation in which it showed that according to Facebook's own internal research, problems have repeatedly been flagged up with how the site is used, for example, by human traffickers, or even disturbing data on how the platform affects the mental health of teenage girls. Despite knowing the extent of these issues, Facebook has never done enough to fix them. Project Amplify was all about enhancing Facebook's public image. And then there are the problems that social media sites like Facebook, like Instagram, keep running into down under in Australia. Yeah, CNN has now decided to disable its Facebook page in Australia. And this is after a high court there ruled that publishers are legally liable for defamatory comments under the posts of news organizations or any media sites. CNN asked Facebook for help to disable the comments function in Australia, but the company says it cannot do location-specific comment disabling. If you switch off comments on a Facebook page in one location or in one country, you essentially disable it for users around the world who come to that page. This High Court ruling has significant impact on Australian media companies. Many of them just don't allow comments on their posts any longer because moderating or policing a comment section takes too much time, takes too many moderators, and just too much money. Okay, thanks, Mina. It's something you see in news coverage all the time, or hear, the voice of translator, and they don't always get it right. The translation of literature from one language to another is an even trickier business. Literature is much more subtle than journalism. It's less direct. And languages come with particularities, audiences with their own cultures and expectations. The language most frequently translated into English by American publishers is French, followed by Spanish. When it comes to Arabic and Persian, translations have been known to come up short, leading to cultural misunderstandings, the kind that reading the texts of the other are supposed to correct. 
In many cases, foreign language novels are selected for translation by publishers because they can help explain a country's politics or its current affairs. And when translators or editors fail in their jobs, context can be sacrificed and stereotypes can get reinforced. The Listening Post's Tarek Nafa now with a look at what gets lost in translation. The most important part of literary translation for me is to capture the voice of the text that you're working with. So you're not just translating them across languages and across cultures, you're translating them across time. Nuance, of course, will be lost, but also nuances can be rediscovered. That's part of the alchemy that is literary translation. One thing that's poorly understood about translation is that when a text moves from one language to another, it is transformed. It is almost never word for word. So translators become cultural mediators, balancing faithfulness to the original with the needs of a new audience. There's this old world notion of translation as a kind of sterile mechanical process that involves a, a direct reproduction of a text into a target language that is more or less faithful to the letter or spirit of the original. But that's not the case, and it's almost never the case. I don't think there can ever, ever, ever be a totally faithful translation, because any translator coming across anything has to read the text and then decode it and put it back into another language, and all languages are different. Translation is the manipulation of a text into not only a target language, but a target culture, a target consumption environment. And consequently, this process will be impacted by power imbalances, by ideologies, by perceptions, preconceptions, misconceptions. In the 19th century, an era of European imperialist expansion, a group of Western scholars, painters and translators known as Orientalists took an interest in the Middle East. But their reimaginings of Arab and Persian culture were often detached from the realities of the people that fascinated and beguiled them. Richard Francis Burton was an archetypal Orientalist, an explorer, soldier, scholar and spy who once smuggled himself into Mecca disguised as an Arab, Burton is also responsible for the translation of 1001 Nights and the Kama Sutra. Another Englishman, Edward Fitzgerald, took the poetry of Persian polymath Omar Khayyam and transformed it beyond recognition on its way into the Anglosphere. So you have this power dynamic where the, the Westerner basically feels as if they own us. And in a way, they, they really did own us. And our countries kind of became a playground for these uh, Westerners to kind of run around in and find manuscripts and find texts. And they don't feel a responsibility to treat them fairly, or they don't see the culture that they're coming from as equal to them. And this is especially the case with Fitzgerald, who translated Chayyam. He did say, it amuses me to take what liberties I like with these Persians, who really do need a little art to shape them. And that has been seen as one of the, in a sense, most offensive of the old colonial statements about translation. But what Fitzgerald does with Omar Khayyam is he, he turns it into, we must be honest and say, an extraordinarily beautiful poem, so successful that it's generally regarded as, as one of the very, very few cases where a translation entered into the canon of English literature. The world of translation has moved on since Fitzgerald. He wouldn't be given such license today. However, more subtle distortions continue. Publishers can play a role here by selecting or editing translated literature in a way that reinforces old stereotypes. So the, the passive, victimized, veiled Muslim woman, the barbaric, violent Arab male, you know, these are, these are the, the stereotypes that we're talking about. So if the novel already has these themes in it, then it's certainly easier for it to land a translation deal 
in the English-speaking world. Nawal Sa'dawi, this very iconic feminist activist from Egypt. When her texts move from Arabic to English, what essentially happens is that she becomes simplified and she becomes reduced to only caring about quote-unquote women's issues. But she had a wide-ranging remit of critiques. She was an anti-imperialist, an anti-capitalist. Translation can be a murky process, but ultimately the publisher gets the last word. Larry Price was confronted with this after working on In Praise of Hatred by Syrian author Khaled Khalifa. She later discovered that the final chapter she had translated wouldn't be included in the novel. It charts the progression of the narrator, who was a young girl, into a very intolerant version of Islam. And it's narrated in the context of increasing crackdowns against um, any kind of dissent within Syrian society. They decided that they preferred the book to end after chapter three. They felt that it was a stronger ending. In this chapter, Marwa has left Syria and she's now living and working in London. But even though she's ostensibly free and unveiled, she's haunted by the events in her homeland and they have not left her. And so that ending was excised. The way that it reframes the story is consequential because Marwa, the title character, does become this kind of stereotypical, veiled, secluded, oppressed female. And, and it's an image that is reinforced on, on the cover as well. And so the text is made to cater to that rather than disrupt those ideas or those expectations. Increasingly, translators are becoming more outspoken about their work. Persian Poetics is the brainchild of translator Muhammad Ali Mujaradi. It's where he calls out the world-famous but mistranslated quotes of Persian Sufi poet Rumi. One of Rumi's most popular translated verses reads, Out beyond ideas of wrongdoing and rightdoing, there is a field. I'll meet you there. The original, according to Mojaradi, is closer to Beyond heresy and faith, there's another place we yearn for what's in the midst of that desert plain. They kind of stripped away the Islam again, stripped away the, the archaicism, and they took out the Rumi and they blended in this milieu that was existent in the 60s and 70s. This kind of vaguely Eastern Buddhism, Hinduism, Islam, kind of all mixed together with words like guru and mentor and, and things like that. These books have huge impacts on the way that things are perceived. When Islamophobes would say, oh, Islam is this, it's barbaric, it's evil, it's devoid of any deeper meaning, deeper truth. There's no beauty in Islam. Uh, when I would pull up people like Rumi, a lot of times they would say, well, Rumi doesn't count because he's not a Muslim. Translation has always been somewhat of an underappreciated art, with translators often consigned to the margins or remaining totally invisible. That's not the case anymore. The translator's voice is being heard and recognized, and readers are better off when they understand how the mechanics of translations work and how that influences which books you see in your local bookshop. Translation is uh, a dynamic process and it's a process that is never neutral and it is always impacted by power imbalances. It holds within it all of these different contextual ideas and biases and prejudices and being made aware of these factors will enhance your understanding and your appreciation of the text itself and of the culture that it comes from and how it has come to your culture. And finally, after 16 years in the job, Germany's first female chancellor, Angela Merkel, is leaving politics. Merkel worked with four American presidents, five British prime ministers, eight Italian heads of government, scored higher approval ratings than just about any of them, and eventually came to be seen as the de facto head of the European Union. This next video by Puppet Regime, a comedy series by G Zero Media, not to be confused with Al Jazeera, includes some of the policies Merkel will be remembered for. 
like opening Germany's borders to a million Syrian refugees at a time when other countries were shutting theirs. You may recognize the music. It's a remix of a classic from another German powerhouse, Kraftwerk. We'll see you next time here at The Listening Post. It's It's time to say goodbye. I'm moving on to the next. Eins, zwei, drei, vier, fünf, sechs, sieben. That's it, I'm done, I'm out, that's right. Yes, Uncle is leaving when the sh hits the fan. You miss me in your circles, cause no one handles crisis. Quite like Angela Merkel, I kept the Eurozone all in one piece. And everybody loved me for it, well, except for Greece. Then a million Syrians came, I said, yeah, this room. Even though it had to push the neo-Nazi loans Now all across Europa they know my name Yes, I guess I could have done a little more to help Ukraine Still with me around you were all a little spoiled If things go wrong, once I'm gone I'll feel some schadenfreude It's time to say goodbye Here from six I'm moving on to the next Eins, zwei, drei, vier, fünf, sechs, sieben That's it, I'm done, I'm out, that's right Yes, Angela is leaving